Jack, people are looking for you. Yeah. All the wrong people. So after making a name as a Max Payne clone and then busting out a prequel and then a PSP title that was a prequel to that prequel, it's only obvious that the next step for the series on the next generation of consoles is to make a reboot of the first game. Because who actually needs sequels anyway? Retribution, unlike the first two games in the series, is not developed by Namco and is actually born from the minds of Volatile Studios, a team known for their video game adaptation of Reservoir Dogs. An interesting title, but when it came to grabbing the torch of the established Dead to Rights series, they decided not to complicate things and simply give the fans of the series more of what they want, shooting and brawling at the hands of an edgy loose cannon cop who has a canine partner with an affinity to ripping out bad guys' carotid arteries. <laughs> Dead to Rights at this point is still kind of an underrated franchise. Definitely not as respected of a series as games like Max Payne, so maybe a gritty 7th gen reboot is just what they needed to revamp this series. You still play as Jack Slate, and he's still a loose cannon as he was in other games, but he is a lot more scruffy and standoffish in this title, and causes a whole lot more brutal bloodshed. Dude's got a sick Alpine Stars motorcycle jacket, and if they got the licensing for it, I'd imagine Imagine he'd have tap out shirts and monster energy cans all over his stuff too. He's just as cool as you can imagine someone being in 2010. The story in Retribution more or less follows the same sort of tale as the first game, just with better explanations and backstory, with a few other key players changed around. Jack's dad dies while he's in an investigation of a man named Riggs, and his death actually seems like it affects Jack more than it did before. Before his reaction was numb and disinterested, while in this game, it's much more emotional. The victim's name is Slate. Frank Slate. My... He's my dad. This is Slate, badge B26354. Officer down! Repeat, I've got an officer down! Uh, uh, uh city port, Darkside East, oh, request immediate assistance! Oh god, oh god, no! Oh god! And that's probably the biggest difference in writing for the stories, or at the very least, the voice acting. Jack Slate feels like someone with feelings and thoughts now, rather than just an empty husk. He's way more fleshed out and upgraded as a character from his 2002 counterparts. And as far as other characters from the story in that game, there aren't many carryovers into this reboot. Even one of the main characters, Hildy, is replaced from the first game by a new female interest named Faith Sands, who is an EMT. So unfortunately, that means there's no more stripper pole minigames. So if that was a selling point for you, just go ahead and leave this one on the shelf. With that being said though, let's talk about the biggest change and, in my opinion, improvements in this game being the gameplay. The game revolves around the same series mainstay mechanics, being brawling, shooting, and dog. Each type of gameplay is vastly improved and takes inspiration from other great games rather than just Max Payne. The shooting reminds me of Gears of War and kind of Uncharted in certain ways, a sort of cover-based combat that feels heavy with its movements but not clunky. The fighting takes some notes from the Batman Arkham game with many more punching combinations and awesome finisher moves, and the shadow sections are oddly enough stealth portions of the game, also taking notes from Batman with a sort of detective mode that Shadow can use to see through walls, giving some nice variety and some peace within the chaos of this over-the-top shooter. The shooting elements of the game add a little more modern aspect to the series while also bringing over some loved elements from prior titles. Jack relies a lot more on taking cover in this game. While it was possible in in previous titles, it was rarely ever used, at least in my experience, and in this game, it's a smoother mechanic and makes certain levels much easier. You can even blind fire around cover this go around, which I don't think was an option in the last games. With that said, it's not the best thing ever. It makes some levels a crawl to get through, and simply hopping from cover to cover and killing a handful of bad guys is not the most engaging gameplay loop. Luckily, it's not the whole game, but it is a larger portion of it. The option to grab a human shield is in this game, but that is also also a whole lot better implemented. Jack sort of muscles them into a bent over position and then uses them as a way to move forward in cover at faster speed and kind of ambushes other guys trying to shoot his face. When grabbing enemies, you get the option to not only use them as a shield, but you can toss them like off of a railing or into an electrified fence and also do some sick disarm moves if they're holding a gun. They aren't as flashy as the disarms in prior games, but that's because those brutal animations are used in the hand-to-hand -hand combat finishers that we'll get to in a second. 
The focus bar in this game functions the same as Adrenaline in prior titles. It is primarily used as fuel for the sweet, sweet slow motion bullet time that we just all love to use. There isn't much to go into about it, so there's nothing really has changed that much with that mechanic. You just slow time down to line up beautiful headshots on your enemies. The guns in this game aren't much to write home about either. They feel sort of generic, like there isn't much oomph to them, they are just kind of a means to an end. Except the shotgun. Shotgun, always best gun. It's kind of hard to fuck up, honestly. It's not a terrible shooting system, but it's pretty bare bones. There are several pistols, shotguns, SMGs, and assault rifles to use, as well as more specialized weaponry like grenade launchers, sniper rifles, and throwables like grenades and flashbangs. All the weapon designs have this sort of futuristic cyberpunk aesthetic to them, which is pretty sick, but like I said, the, they function kind of like regular guns. There isn't anything cool or unique about them. They just, they shoot well and they kill enemies. And there's plenty to go around. There there's more than enough firepower to get the job done in most cases. But of course, if that's not enough, Jack has his hands. Uh, are we just gonna keep talking, old man? Are we gonna actually fight? <laughs> The melee combat in this game is a lot more satisfying to get into. Not as much as a chore this go around, and actually quite fun and in-depth, if you want to take it that way. There are several combinations and fancy moves that you can do. Absolutely brutal finisher moves, slick counterattacks, and even cool ways to break the guard of an enemy to land some hits, all while being more functional in an environment where you get surrounded by several enemies at once, with a way to have directional attacks, kind of like the Arkham games fighting style. A vast improvement over the mechanics in the prior games. Even with all those changes, I wouldn't say the melee combat is the star of the show here. I don't like how shoehorned in it is in a lot of sections, like the opening chapter makes sense because Jack gives his badge and his gun to the captain before disobeying orders and entering the building, but in other sections, Jack resorts to fisticuffs simply because he wants to or his dad suggests it. Let's take a look, but no gunfire. Shooting guns is still how I'd prefer to play this game, and thankfully that is still the vast majority of the gameplay. But when you are forced to fight, at least it is fun this time. Circling back on those brutal finisher moves though, these things have gone off the deep end. These are manhunt and punisher levels of brutal, and I think they are a bit slept on. Advancing from the already brutal hand-to-hand -hand ones, once Jack starts adding weapons into the equation, it gets R-rated very fast. He throws a grenade in a guy's shirt and then tosses him into the air before he explodes, or knocks a guy to the ground with a leg sweep from his sniper rifle before impaling his skull with the barrel and then firing it like that wasn't enough damage. Or my personal favorite, he throws a guy down and then steps on his back while shooting him point blank with a grenade launcher using the explosion to launch into the air like a superhero. This guy is an officer of the law by the way. But these brutal animations all tie into the gritty revamping of the series, and I'm absolutely not mad at them. The last part of the gameplay that was heavily revamped were the sections where you control Shadow. Good boy. When it comes to normal gaming as Jack, Shadow is about the same as prior games as far as in-game functionality. You get a little more control of him and what he does in the midst of gameplay, but he sort of functions the same. You can use him to scout ahead, attack enemies, pick up guns, or even hold a guy still while you finish him off. Still the best doggo that there is, even though I think tasting all that human blood may have an effect on his psyche at this point. The big change comes in the missions where you control Shadow independently of Jack. Controlling Shadow like this is a first for the series in terms of attacking and having some kind of agency. In the first game you controlled Shadow for some bomb sniffing expeditions, but in this game you get to give him a 5 star course of Cowboy Cavalry. VR. The game actually opens up with a brief prologue that is predominantly shadow gameplay, but it only consists of running around and attacking guys as they try to shoot at an injured Jack. The real innovation to shadow comes in later missions, where Jack sends shadow into a locked area to retrieve keys to open the door. These missions are sort of stealth based operations, shadow prowls in the shadows, killing guards silently and even hiding their bodies so they don't get discovered and raise some alarms. He has a special vision that senses heartbeats through walls and gives him an advantage on enemies. Kind of another feat taken from the Batman Arkham games as it's quite similar to Batman's detective vision. It's fair to say that Shadow truly lives up to his name in these portions of the game. These areas are nice changes of pace for the game, but again, it's not the main draw of the game and that's okay. I think these 
portions where you aren't just running and gunning are valuable to the series as a whole, because that run and gun gameplay gets very boring very quickly, even though it was revamped and improved upon. You need a little change of pace to get the crowd going. Dead to Rights 2 is a testament to that. All in all though, Retribution has the best and most engaging combat and gameplay in the whole series, and I think Volatile did a terrific job translating the core values of the series into a modern title with fluid mechanics and brutality. I think they also knocked the storytelling out of the park too, so with that being said, let's dissect the plot of this game. Everything on TV, it's a lie. You want the truth, I'll tell you the truth. CNN is fake news. The game starts with our hero, Jack Slate, bruised and battered, stepping gracefully out of a boat that pulls into some industrial looking docks. He's greeted by some thugs that recognize him as the fuck who had them run out of Chinatown and they decided to get some revenge on him in his weakened state for this, especially since his trusty canine companion is nowhere to be seen. But as soon as they move towards Jack, Shadow is seen, and he's an angry boy. This short little prologue is just about three minutes of running around as Shadow and tearing guys to shreds while an injured Jack waddles behind. But once all the thugs are dead, Jack manages to make his way up to a diner to meet with someone named Faith. Faith mentions how people are worried and looking for him, and asks him to reach out to the department for help, but Jack says that there's no more department, and everything on the TV is a lie. Jack decides to tell Faith the truth, and that starts with going back in time a little bit. That's right, the whole plot of this game is a flashback explained by Jack to Faith in this diner. A news team is reporting outside of a news company skyscraper in Grant City. A group of bad boys has taken this building hostage, and they haven't really made any public demands. They just sort of interrupted a live broadcast that was ironically addressing the rise of crime in the city. Jack arrives on the scene and shoulder checks the fuck out of the reporter on his way up to the building, which she doesn't appreciate too much. What the hell? Excuse me, do you know who I am? Before walking up to the officer in charge and not treating him much better. He essentially calls the negotiating officer shit at his job, and as he's picking apart his piss poor strategy, a hostage gets tossed from the roof, and Jack decides he's just gonna get in there and stop them himself. The commanding officer tries to stop Jack, saying that he'll have his badge and his gun for this, and Jack, being the loose cannon that he is, gives it to him in a very dramatic fashion anyway. Here, you point it in that direction and you pull this to make it go bang. Feel free to point it at a bad guy if you ever end up facing one. So Jack walks into this building unarmed, but we all know that's not a problem. The first waves of enemies are all unarmed as well, allowing him to wet his knuckles a little bit with their blood, before reaching a security guard who lets you access a private elevator and then watching another elevator full of innocent people fall 90 something stories to their deaths. In his ride up to the top, Jack sees the news report saying that the people he's fighting here are part of the dock workers union, but he calls bullshit as they aren't nearly organized enough to pull this off. After clearing the whole floor of bad guys with guns, eventually Jack makes it out to a rooftop area where he saves a woman who can give him access to the penthouse and get to the bottom, or the top, of this terrorist attack. From here, Jack gets a name on the radio that the union members were using, a leader of this attack named Riggs. As he gets to the top floor, he rescues some security guards being held hostage, and unlike the police commander down below in the streets, they pick up some guns and start helping Jack clear the floor. Eventually, Jack runs into Riggs, who blows a hole into the side of the building in order to escape, which leads to a foot chase along the rooftop of the skyscraper. Reaching the top at the helipad, a military gunship arrives to scoop up Riggs, and he flies away releasing a bird as he goes, confirming to Jack that he is indeed not Union. But the Union is the only lead that Jack has at this point, so that's where he's off to next. But not before he gets reprimanded by the same wimpy cop doing interrogations at the news building. Captain Aness is his name. Jack clearly does not give a fuck, but it's kind of clear that no one gives a fuck about Aness or even respects him as the captain of the SWAT team named Redwater just walks in and interrupts this meeting. You asshole. Whoa, whoa, what did you call me? Called you an asshole. Hey, Jack. 
pretty much just starting a new conversation with Jack, trying to recruit him to the SWAT team. After this brief convo, Jack's dad, Frank, swoops in and takes him up to his appointment, a boxing session between the two of them. This is just a glorified fighting combo tutorial, but also a moment to show how close Jack and his father are. I brought you up right, and you made a right call just to prove it. You won't find me anything but proud. After their sparring session, Frank decides he's going to join Jack on his trip down to the docks to get some intel on the Union. He's interested in the case, and particularly the military guy leading them. They reach the lock gate and decide to have Shadow take the lead through the area and retrieve some keys for them. So Shadow murders about a dozen dudes and brings back the key card so the duo can just stroll on in. There are still plenty of bad guys hanging around, but Frank decides there will be no shooting. So luckily, the enemies follow close instructions as well, and there's just fisty cuffs ahead as they explore. They find some evidence of blueprints and training areas for the news building, showing that they practiced and coordinated this attack, again, not something that the Union would typically do or be organized enough to do. Eventually, Frank, Jack, and Shadow get the drop on two Union guys, and instead of immediately killing them, they decide to try to get some information. But before they talk, the SWAT team led by Redwater shows up and kills them ending any attempts at interrogating any of the rest of the Union as well, so a full-on shootout takes place. Frank blows up on Redwater, telling him he's out of line. Redwater said that he was just trying to help as two guys and a dog weren't enough firepower to take down the Union, but now he fucked the situation up as there's no way for Frank and Jack to get a lead now. After the shootout, they decide to head deeper into the shipyard and see what they can find, and soon enough they run into Riggs himself and a Triad member talking. So now it's more than just the Union. Riggs spots them and runs off, with the Triad named the Black Hand running in the other direction. Frank and Shadow chase after Riggs while Jack runs after the Triad. As soon as Jack corners and arrests the Triad, he discovers that his dad is there as well, and he's shot in the chest. And this is by far the best acted scene in the entire franchise, and one of the best scenes in general. I can't stop the bleeding. I can't. I can't. I need help. Help! Help! Oh God! No! Hold on. Hold on. Dad, come on. Dad, just stay with me. Stay with me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Focus on me. Look at me. They're coming. They're, they're coming. They're coming. Just stay. Oh God, no. Stay with me. They'll be here any second. They'll be here any second. Just... Jesus Christ, where are they? Dad, hold on! As he realizes his dad is dead, he rampages on the Black Hand, trying to get information but also just taking out his grief and anger in this moment. And after Faith talks some sense into him before he kills the Triad, he walks off to find some answers, with Shadow following behind after saying some final goodbyes to Frank. Jack's next lead is the triad leader named Sang, to see why they are meeting with Riggs. As Jack shows up to Chinatown, cops are already here, probably due to Frank's death, and they aren't exactly faring too well against the home team. It's a full-on war in the streets, automatic gunfire, rocket launchers, the works. He fights his way into the warehouse where Sang is, and he finds him executing some cops while sniffing coke all at the same time, and that's some true expertise right there. And the signs that this guy is entirely off of his rocker. Jack kills a couple of thugs, but his sights are set on Sang, and he ends up chasing him out to the top of a moving train. This next section is a timed area where you run from train car to train car against a timer, and you have to not only fight waves of thugs, but also disarm bombs on the way to Sang. But instead of finding the leader, he finds a stack of explosives that take him and the train off the rails, knocking Jack out. So now you control Shadow as he makes his way across the train yard to save Jack. Even though once you get to him, he just drags him two feet back from the falling debris and this is enough to wake Jack up, I guess. Anyway, so now the two of them continue the pursuit of Sang, heading to Grant Central Station, a clever remix of the famous NYC terminal. Sang is planning to blow the place up, so again, it's another race against the bomb timer mission. But soon enough, Jack gets Sang cornered. Sang isn't an easy target by any means, though, and thoroughly fucks Jack up in his attempt to take him down. You can not kill me, Mr. Policeman. <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Jack is forced to take him out by throwing him onto the train tracks like a finisher move in Def Jam Fight for New York. 
This means Jack saved Grant Central, but also means that he has no more intel on Riggs. All he knows at this point is Riggs paid both the Union and the Triads to tear the city apart. The Union attempted to take the news station, and the Triads attempted to take out the main subway hub. Luckily, Jack stopped them both. In order to find out where Riggs is doing this though, Jack has to go back to the docks where his dad died to see what Riggs was shipping there. Jack arrives at the pool of blood left by his father right next to the entrance of the docks that he intends to search. Yet another shadow stealth mission to get the key key here, but soon enough Jack is in to explore as well, and he finds the blueprints to Riggs' entire plan here. He finds pictures of his enforcers, but also the SWAT captain Redwater and photos of the stadium project going on in the city. But most importantly, he finds a voice recording of Julian Temple and Riggs planning this whole thing, even confirming that Redwater is involved too. Julian Temple, of course, being the guy that Riggs was pretending to torture in the penthouse of the news building. It was all a ruse, all set up by Temple to make him look good, like someone who acts strong in the face of a terrorist. Jack decides to explore the docks a little bit more and he finds some advanced military gear, labeled as property of Grant City PD, but a department Jack doesn't recognize, GAC, or Grant City Anti-Crime, a not so welcome reappearance from the first game. Jack even makes fun of the acronym as it doesn't really make too much sense. GAC, Grant City Anti-Crime. Should have been GCAC, I guess, but that wouldn't roll off the tongue quite as well. This also means that GAC troops become the newest enemy for Jack and Shadow in the game, so no more easy street with dock workers and triad members. Jack fights his way into the sewer system of Grant City while battling the pseudo-military force that is GAC, until eventually he reaches the stadium construction project that has become the new base for this anti-crime task force. You learn through some exposition that the stadium was funded by a man named William Pinnacle, a guy who had big visions for Grant City and wanted the stadium to bring more money to the city. He also was a candidate for mayor at some point, but he ended up in prison, so no one picked up the tab for the stadium construction. This is another nod to the original game's plots, or kind of an alternate history in the way that the plot points kind of diverged in the two games. Jack fights long and hard to get up into the stadium, facing some crazy new enemies and a lot of them. The GAC tank was pretty freaking cool, and I just really like the design that they did with the GAC units overall this go around. As Jack gets to the center of the base, he finds Temple on the news broadcast revealing his strategy. Cause chaos in order to get emergency power to fix it, and then take that power and run with it. Temple caused the tower takeover and the train station bombs, and now he's using those excuses to deploy his GAC military on the city and reign over it. Once Riggs hears this broadcast, he knows that he's in the clear and he no longer needs the help from the criminal scum like the dock workers in the triad so he immediately kills them off. Jack decides he is a one man army as usual and continues to infiltrate their base and take out their resources starting with their gunships. Once he takes out about 50 soldiers and 3 helicopters he finally runs into Riggs who admits that he can't just fly away so it's time to fight one on one. And one on one means every piece of technology in the place and about a dozen more more soldiers as well. The Riggs fight ends kind of unceremoniously. He just falls. No witty dialogue, no cutscene, bad guy just dead. Jack moves on to blow up the final gunship in the area before heading out, and as he places this final brick of explosives, he gets ambushed by none other than Redwater. He knocks Jack out and he flies away with him in the chopper. Redwater explains that he did what needed to be done to take out the scum in the city, even though as Jack points out, the scum was hired to cause chaos, and this is all manufactured. Also, Riggs is alive, I guess. I don't know what happened there. I guess that's just why his death was so cut and dry. He didn't actually die. Jack tries talking some sense into Redwater, telling him that Riggs is planning on killing him anyway, playing the voice recording from earlier, proving it. So before Riggs could react, Redwater stabs him in the chest and then tosses him out of the chopper. Jack grabs him as he falls, but this causes him just to fall to the ground with him as well. Redwater tosses the explosives that Jack said earlier before flying away, leaving Jack in a dead Riggs on the helipad. 
At least, I think Riggs is actually dead this time. This brings us back to present day, or at least to where Jack is in the diner telling his tale to Faith. After this run-in with Redwater and Riggs, he got into a tugboat and landed on the docks and crawled his way to the diner with the help of Shadow clearing the way. In their discussion, it's made clear that Faith meeting him here was a setup. Redwater convinced Faith that Jack was off the deep end because his dad died. Jack doesn't hold this against her though. She had no way to know the truth. Redwater is a police officer after all. So now she decides to help Jack get back at Temple and Redwater. Faith calls in an EMT helicopter to meet her on the roof and fly Jack right up to Temple's penthouse from the first level in the game. But before she can complete the call, she gets sniped through the window. I guess that EMT chopper is actually needed now. Gak storms the place and Jack has to juggle hitting them in waves while dragging Faith's body to the medevac. Which, I mean, I'll take this over an escort mission. Once they make it up to the rooftop, the chopper starts to leave because Gak opens up minigun fire on them. Understandably, of course, unless you're Jack Slate, who has no time for fear of bullets. I need that medevac to land, now! trying to land but have been fired upon. I'll take care of that! Just keep the bird in the air, and I'll let you know when it's clear to land. <laughs> Jack clears the way and allows the chopper to land safely. He loads up Faith and then hops in himself, dropping her off at the hospital and then asks the pilot for a favor bringing him to Temple's penthouse. Jack storms the gak infested tower from the beginning of the game and rushes towards Temple's penthouse. And once he reaches him, Temple tries to play the victim again, thinking that Jack has no idea that he's the mastermind behind all this. Jack and Shadow clearly aren't playing any games, but Jack doesn't know the whole truth. Jack thinks that Temple ordered Riggs to kill his father, but actually, he says that was never in the plan. Redwater killed Frank Slate, and now Redwater has also killed Riggs, and now he's after Temple. He's taking over the whole operation like it's his own. Jack loses his shit, learning that Redwater killed his dad. But he channels the good cop his father was and decides not to kill Temple, but to arrest him instead. And once he learns the location of Redwater from him, he has his eyes set on him, on an island called Danvers Island. Arresting Temple is not as easy as it sounds, as Gak have once again swarmed the Temple Towers. But even once they clear that and they get to the precinct, that too is overrun by Gak enforcers. Jack eventually makes it to the holding cells and Temple stays alive, somehow too, even after Jack uses him as a literal bullet shield for the last half an hour. Captain Ines is near the cells as well, and Jack sort of makes up with him with their differences. Ines is kind of the only ally that he has left at this point, so better to make friends now than never. Ines and the rest of the police force left alive decide to fight back against Redwater and the Gak's attempt to take over the city. They fight their way for control over the precinct, with the help of Jack and Shadow of course, and eventually they take it back. Gak units are ordered to retreat back to Danvers Island by Redwater once they lose control of this precinct, and Jack comes up with a plan to get into the island unnoticed. He puts on one of the Gak uniforms of a fallen soldier and he hops on the extraction gunship telling Ines to meet him at the island when he gives a vague, loud signal. And he also tells him to bring Shadow. Jack stays in disguise, making it to a meeting with Redwater where he chews out the Gak squad, bitching about how one guy and his dog is overthrowing this whole operation. The whole place is full of people just talking shit about Slate, calling him a tough son of a bitch, but also saying they want to kill him as soon as possible. I believe it. Slate's still in one piece. He's a tough son of a bitch, I'll give him that. I heard his dog will rip your head off. Yeah, and piss on you like you're a fucking lamppost. Once Jack meanders over to the armory though and he grabs a gun, he starts an assault on the base, using a grenade launcher to signal a nest to move in with the GCPD. This is another long and drawn out gunfight at the base, until Jack runs into some new tech that he decides he wants to use, one of those fancy Gak tank suits. Jack guns down dozens of dudes in his fancy new power armor all while arguing with Redwater over the comms. Redwater saying that he did what he had to do. He killed Frank because he got close to the Gak project and he would have never gotten on board with it. Gak needed to happen for the city and Frank was just in the way. Jack eventually ditches the tank suit and makes his way on foot to Redwater, where he's hiding in the lighthouse on the island. He's about to take Jack out with the turret, but Shadow gets the drop on him and attacks. Redwater fights him off though and kicks him to the ground, hurting him pretty bad. Bad move on his part though, he killed Jack's dad and he shot Jack's girlfriend, but you never kick a man's dog. 
Jack goes on to the top of the lighthouse and kicks Red's ass. And in an act of defiance, Red smugly tells Jack that he knew he wasn't going to arrest him, as Jack plunges a knife into his chest and he falls into the ocean. Even though after killing like 500 dudes in the past 24 hours, I don't think Jack is too worried about one more guy not ending up in the prison system. Shadow hobbles up to Jack with his widow hurt paw and the game ends here. There is a cutscene after this of Frank's funeral and he's awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously from the mayor and Jack and Faith make up again as well. Jack and Shadow say their final goodbyes to Frank and then the credits actually roll. Death to Rights Retribution is by far the best entry into the franchise, but unfortunately that wasn't really a high bar to beat, as the game still isn't that good. It's not bad, but considering the time period when it came out, surrounded by the likes of Red Dead Redemption, Fallout New Vegas, Alan Wake and Bioshock 2, and several other greatest of all time caliber games, Retribution was too little too late for the series. The game got mixed reviews from critics and players alike, and the general consensus was that the game was fun, but it felt like a title released in 2007 rather than 2010. And in those days, three years made the world of difference when it came to advancements in game tech. Retribution is the last time that we've seen a dead to rights game. And although there is always the chance that Jack Slate and Shadow would make a return to the gaming sphere, I don't see that happening anytime soon. There isn't many people swooning over this series like others that have been abandoned for years. There are fans with fond memories of the games, but the demand for a reboot or reappearance of Jack Slate just isn't there. Namco hasn't been doing much in video games for the past few years though, so who knows? Maybe revamping old IPs will be their next course of action for the company. I for one am happy that I played all the games this year. I had some fond memories replaying the first one. The second one wasn't great, I don't want to revisit that one ever again, but this one actually was quite a bit of fun. It's not the greatest game ever made, but it's definitely not the worst game ever made. It's like solid middle of the road, fun shoot 'em up. And I think that there's a lot of promise for the franchise if they do ever decide to reboot it. And if they do, I'd be first in line to get a copy and play it with a smile on my face. As long as it's not some crazy multiplayer DLC cosmetic skin bullshit. With that being said, I'd like to shout out my supporters on Patreon and the YouTube members. Doc Schwinn, Kid Kingpin, Zachary Park, Parkerson, Snowflake, Anonymous Starkweather, Crash Bandicoot 25, Grand Taquito, Ben Stevens, Potty, Yay Man, Alfred Correa, Marshall Duff, Kenneth Butler, Scribe Slendy, Matthew Taylor, Nick the Brosa, Ethan Carpenter, Nico Mendez, Grizzly Wisley, Sexy Pickles, Forge Nas, and Mike Easton. As always, thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time. Peace.